Hey everyone, I'm Mr. Willis, and you will love economics. Banks are financial institutions that are licensed to accept deposits and make loans. Chances are, you store the value of your money in an M1 or M2 bank account and access your money through debit cards or personal checks or cash withdrawals at the ATM. But when you deposit your money in a bank, the bank doesn't just throw it into some vault in the back with your name on it. The bank immediately divides your money up and puts it to work. Let's take a closer look at how banks work. Banks are firms. And like all the firms, they seek to maximize profits. They also happen to serve as intermediary bodies that help the Federal Reserve control the money supply. Ultimately, banks can both earn profits and help the Fed through a process known as fractional reserve banking. Fractional reserve banking is the practice whereby a bank accepts deposits, but is required to hold a fraction of its deposits in cash reserves. The bank is then allowed to loan out the remainder of the deposit to borrowers in the form of new loans. The process begins when a demand deposit is made into a bank account. A demand deposit is a deposit of money left in a bank that can be withdrawn without prior notice. Demand deposits can be withdrawn by an account holder at any time. The bank is required to take a portion of the demand deposit and hold it in cash reserves and is not allowed to lend it out or use it in any way. These cash reserves are known as required reserves. The percentage of every demand deposit that banks must hold in required reserves is determined by the reserve ratio which is set by the Federal Reserve. After the required reserves are held, the portion of the demand deposit that remains is known as excess reserves. Banks can use excess reserves several ways. Most often, banks make excess reserves available to borrowers in the form of new loans. Once they are made available for lending, excess reserves become known as loanable funds. When issuing new loans from its excess reserves, the bank will charge borrowers an interest rate to borrow funds. This interest rate is higher than the interest rate the bank owes to account holders who deposit their money in the bank, allowing the bank to earn profits over time. For example, if you invest $100 in an M2 savings account at your local bank, the bank will pay you an interest rate to use the money invested in your account. If your bank pays you 2% annually on the $100 balance in your M2 account, the bank will charge borrowers an interest rate that is higher than 2% to borrow from them. If the bank lends out the excess reserves from your $100 M2 deposit at an interest rate of 4%, the bank can take the interest rate they earn on the loans they issue and pay the 2% it owes to you, and then keep the rest as profits. Banks can also hold excess reserves in their vaults to cover their affairs. If banks expect economic conditions to worsen, they may decide to hold excess reserves in order to cover withdrawals or pay for extra costs that they might incur. However, there's an opportunity cost to holding excess reserves. Banks lose the potential to collect interest and earn profits when they hold on to loanable funds that otherwise could have been made available in the form of new loans. Banks can also use excess reserves to invest in bonds and other securities. Banks will compare the profits they could potentially earn by collecting interest from new loans and the profits they could potentially earn by investing in securities. And if the securities offer a greater chance for profits, they can use excess reserves to purchase those securities. In the end, regardless of how banks use their excess reserves, they must be able to cover any and all withdrawals when account holders ask for their demand deposits back. Fractional reserve banking is the process by which the Federal Reserve controls the money supply and is the driving force behind the creation of new money in the banking system and the aggregate economy. When the Fed wants to either increase or decrease the money supply, it doesn't just print new bills or destroy old ones. The Board of Governors will use banks and the reserve requirement to either increase or decrease the volume of excess reserves and loanable funds available in the banking system. You see, excess reserves are the key to money creation. These reserves and the loanable funds created from them are the new money that circulates in and out of the hands of consumers and firms that has a direct impact on borrowing and spending in the economy. Think about it. When a demand deposit is made into a bank account, it creates a sum of excess reserves after the bank holds its required reserves. These excess reserves are made available in the form of loanable funds to any and all borrowers who demand them. These loanable funds did not exist until the demand deposit was made and, in essence, were created through fractional reserve banking. As a result, the excess reserves created by all demand deposits are new money and increase the money supply in the aggregate economy. When a demand deposit is withdrawn from a bank account, 
It forces the bank to call in loans from its lenders in order to cover the withdrawal. This reduces the sum of excess reserves available in the banking system. All of the loanable funds that could have been lent out to borrowers from that demand deposit are now lost to the economy, and the banking system loses lending capacity. As a result, the volume of new money in the banking system is reduced, and the supply of money has decreased in the aggregate economy. But the money creation process doesn't stop there. When excess reserves are loaned out from demand deposits, they will, one way or another, find their way back in the banks in the form of demand deposits. When these loanable funds are redeposited back into banks, it sets off a chain reaction of money creation throughout the entire economy. Each demand deposit will create greater sums of excess reserves and loanable funds, which will create greater sums of new money in the banking system. This is known as the money multiplier effect. For example, let's assume that the Federal Reserve has set the reserve ratio at 10%, and an investor deposits $1,000 into an M1 account at their local bank. The bank will hold 10%, or $100, of the $1,000 demand deposit in required reserves, and it will initially lend out the remaining $900 of excess reserves in the form of loanable funds. At this point, $900 of new money has been created in the economy from the initial $1,000 deposit. When the $900 of new loans are eventually redeposited back into a bank, the bank will hold 10%, or $90, of the $900 demand deposit in required reserves and it will lend out the remaining $810 of excess reserves in the form of loanable funds. At this point, $1,710 of new money has been created in the economy from the initial $1,000 deposit. When the $810 of new loans are eventually redeposited back into a bank, the bank will hold 10%, or $81, of the $810 demand deposit in required reserves, and it will lend out the remaining $729 of excess reserves in the form of loanable funds. At this point, $2,439 of new money has been created in the economy from the initial $1,000 deposit. If we continued the process until no additional loans could be created and banks could lend out no more, we would find that the initial $1,000 demand deposit initiated a multiplier effect that generated $9,000 in new money and loanable funds throughout the economy. This process could be exhausting if it was required every time economists needed to calculate the potential impact of deposits and withdrawals on the money supply. Luckily for us, there's an easy way to finding the potential change in the money supply that will come about from monetary policy use and fractional reserve banking. It's called the money multiplier. The money multiplier can be found by dividing 1 by the reserve ratio. Here's a quick tip to calculating the money multiplier. When dividing 1 by the reserve ratio, Flip the fraction. The reserve ratio is expressed as a decimal or a percentage, which can also be converted into a fraction. Simply flip the fraction upside down and you'll have your money multiplier. Here are the most common money multipliers, paired together with the most common reserve ratios you'll see in this course. A reserve ratio of 0.1 will mean a money multiplier of 10. A reserve ratio of 0.2 will mean a money multiplier of 5. A reserve ratio of 0.25 will mean a money multiplier of 4. A reserve ratio of 0.4 will mean a money multiplier of 2.5. And a reserve ratio of 0.5 will mean a money multiplier of 2. Once you have determined the money multiplier, you can simply take the size of the initial change in the money supply and multiply it by the money multiplier to determine the full potential change in the money supply that can occur. However, when identifying the initial change in the money supply, you must always consider where the money originates from. When the money deposited was already M1, M2, or M3, it was already part of the money supply. And so, the initial change in the money supply will occur when the first initial loans are made from the deposit. When the money deposited originates from the Federal Reserve, the money injection must be included when calculating the full potential change in the money supply because the money comes from the Treasury and therefore was not previously part of the M1, M2, or M3 money supply. For example, suppose that I take $2,000 from a safe at home and invest it in an M2 interest-bearing savings account. At the time of my deposit, the reserve ratio is 25%, and by using the reserve ratio, we can determine that the money multiplier is 4. Initially, there is no change in the money supply as a result of my deposit, because I simply took M1 and transferred it to M2. However, the bank will hold 25%, or $500 of the $2,000 demand deposit in required reserves. 
and it will initially lend out the remaining $1,500 of excess reserves in the form of loanable funds. At this point, $1,500 of new money has initially been created in the economy from my $2,000 deposit. When the $1,500 of new loans are eventually redeposited back into banks, it sets off a chain reaction of fractional reserve banking that will increase required reserves, excess reserves, and the money supply through the multiplier effect. Ultimately, my $2,000 demand deposit initially increased the money supply by $1,500 and could potentially create as much as $6,000 in new money throughout the banking system and the aggregate economy. Now suppose that the Federal Reserve buys $10 billion worth of Treasury bonds from investors in the open market. When the Fed purchases the T-bonds, it hands over $10 billion in new money to investors in exchange for their assets, which injects new money directly into the economy from the Treasury. As a result, the open market operation conducted by the Fed initially increased the money supply by $10 billion. Now assume that at the time of the open market operation, the reserve ratio is 20%, and by using the reserve ratio, we can determine that the money multiplier is 5. As the investors who sold their bonds to the Fed deposit their earnings into banks, the banks will hold 20% or $2 billion of the $10 billion demand deposits in required reserves, and they will initially lend out the remaining $8 billion of excess reserves in the form of loanable funds. At this point, $18 billion of new money has been created in the economy from the purchase of $10 billion in Treasury bonds by the Federal Reserve. When the $8 billion of new loans are eventually redeposited back into banks, it sets off a chain reaction of fractional reserve banking that will increase required reserves, excess reserves, and the money supply through the multiplier effect. Ultimately, the $10 billion demand deposits by investors who sold their T-bonds to the Fed could potentially create up to $40 billion in new money throughout the banking system. Combined with the initial money injection of $10 billion, the purchase of bonds on the open market by the Federal Reserve could potentially increase the money supply by as much as $50 billion. When calculating the total potential decrease in the money supply through the multiplier effect, we must analyze the lending capacity lost in the economy. For example, suppose that you withdraw $1,000 from an M1 checking account at your local bank. At the time of your withdrawal, the reserve ratio is 10%, and by using the reserve ratio, we can determine that the money multiplier is 10. Initially, there is no change in the money supply as a result of your withdrawal because you're simply withdrawing M1 cash from an M1 account. However, the bank was holding 10% or $100 of the $1,000 demand deposit in required reserves, and it was lending out the remaining $900 of excess reserves in the form of loanable funds. Through the multiplier effect of fractional reserve banking, the banking system was able to create as much as $9,000 of new loans from your deposit. But now that your deposit has been withdrawn, those potential loans cannot be made, and the lending capacity of the banking system has been decreased. Ultimately, your $1,000 withdrawal could potentially decrease the money supply by as much as $9,000 throughout the banking system and the aggregate economy. Now suppose that the Federal Reserve sells $20 billion worth of Treasury bonds to investors in the open market. When the Fed sells the T-bonds, it takes $20 billion directly out of the hands of investors and transfers those funds to the Treasury. As a result, the open market operation conducted by the Fed initially decreases the money supply by $20 billion. Now assume that at the time of the open market operation, the reserve ratio is 50%. And by using the reserve ratio, we can determine that the money multiplier is 2. As the investors who bought their bonds from the Fed liquefied their assets and withdrew M1 cash from their banks, demand deposits decreased by $20 billion across the banking system. The banks were holding 50% or $10 billion of the $20 billion demand deposits in required reserves. And they were lending out the remaining $10 billion of excess reserves in the form of loanable funds. Through the multiplier effect of fractional reserve banking, the banking system was able to create as much as $20 billion of new loans from those deposits. But now that those deposits have been withdrawn, those potential loans cannot be made, and the lending capacity of the banking system has been decreased. Ultimately, 
The $20 billion in demand deposits withdrawn by investors who bought their T-bonds from the Fed could potentially decrease the money supply by as much as $20 billion throughout the banking system. Combined with the initial money decrease of $20 billion, the selling of bonds in the open market by the Federal Reserve could potentially decrease the money supply by as much as $40 billion. And that's banks and money creation. Be sure to subscribe to the channel by hitting the red button below so you can receive alerts about new videos when they become available. If you enjoyed the channel or find my videos useful, let me know by liking the video and feel free to leave a comment below. We have full video lectures on every topic in macro and microeconomics, as well as quick macro and micro minute videos for cram sessions and quick reviews. If you'd like to learn more, you can click here for my macro minute video on the velocity of money, or you can click here for my macro minute video on the money multiplier. Thank you so much for watching. I'll see you next time on Ubalov Economics.